Yeah. All right, good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Uh, the last mining seminar of this semester. So, uh, Leah Lady presented in the about a month or two ago, and then we have two additional students to present today. First is Akashi. Uh, he's working on a PhD. Hopefully, he can graduate next semester. <laughs> I don't know, but I'm <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> so uh, right. he's a PhD candidate uh, in a geological engineering, right? Mining engineering, and um, so he's going to talk about large scale. Lab testing of supported and an unsupported pillar analog. So uh, please welcome Akashi. So, hello everyone. Uh, today I'll be presenting on this uh, large scale laboratory testing of supported and unsupported pillar analogs. So, this work I just submitted on a journal paper and it's under review. This is my second topic of my PhD thesis. So, I'll be presenting on this. And uh, yeah, my advisor is uh, Dr. Gavin Walton. And this paper is written by, like, you can see the author's list. Like six Company yeah. down low, put it right up there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fine, yeah. <laughs> So as we know, the underground pillars, basically they provide the natural stability to the mining area. And, and then you have to not look at the slides, you have to talk into the mic. Every time you turn your head, you get away from the mic. Yeah. Or you can hold this if you want to. Okay. Go ahead. That's fine. It's okay. Speak up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Go ahead. So basically, the underground uh, mine pillars they provide natural stability to the you know mining area, and it allows basically safe op operations for the workers as well as machineries. And you can see we can have like these uh, pillars both in underground as well as in high wall mining. And this, the design of these uh, pillars are basically based on the empirical approaches, which are very like you know particular or uh, particular to the uh, geological conditions. But now with the uh, new computational you know advancement, we can design these pillars and their behavior with the with the numerical techniques. But despite this like you know advancement and the designing methods, we can still see the pillar failures and roof failures. And you can see these figures, the total injuries and total fatalities, right? So for the last 10 years, this the total injuries and the fatalities, they haven't gone down. Despite this, the advancement in the numerical modeling technique as well as the lab facilities and lab testing. However, like we can support few unstable pillars in a panel with the uh, support systems such as wire mesh, rock bolt, or you know, sort grid, and maybe it can enhance the integrity of the pillars or the stability of the pillars. And that, that way we can uh, basically increase the factor of safety. However, like you know, before moving and designing the pillar support or anything, we need to understand the mechanism of pillar support interaction. So therefore, like before moving in my research, I just want to discuss the behavior of a particular rock board, rocket rock board, when uh, inserted in a pillar, when we load them in a static uh, uh, condition. So as you can see, when we load a pillar in a uh, in, uh, in excel compressive uh, direction, we can have both like you know dilations and shear movement of the cracks. And if you see the this particular cross sections of the grounded board. 
because of this lateral opening, because of the dilation of the fractures, as well as the shear movement of the structure, we can have like three to four different components of the forces on the rock boards. We can have uh, axial load on the rock board element. We can have lateral load as well as bending moment. And in the interface between the rock and the ground and the rock board, we can have the shear stress generation once like, like because of the pulling of the uh, rock board because of the axial forces. So therefore, like we need to understand all these like uh, micro mechanical behavior of this particular rock board so that we can design safe, safe and economic support designs. So for this particular uh, topic, what we are trying to do is like we want, we, we are performing a laboratory test so that we can study the pillar failure mechanism as well as the uh, pillar support interactions. So we considered large scale samples of limestone where we, we did test under unique compressive uh, conditions, both on unsupported and supported specimens. For the unsupported specimens, we uh, we evaluated the shape and size effect. And for this uh, supported, we uh, used different uh, support components such as router of board, wire mesh, and as well as uh, face plate, so that we can understand the pillar support interactions. Also, like in terms of like monitoring, uh, we also use uh, fiber sensors, uh, distributed fiber optical sensors in the rock board as well as directly in the uh, uh, specimens. And apart from that, we also use the 3D DIC technique to capture the surface deformations. So if you see the testing outline, right, we use the large scale samples. So we kept the cross sections area constant. So our cross section was like 0.5 meter cross 0.5 meter, but the height varies from one meter to 0.25 meter so that we can get like three different width to height ratios. So these are pretty big samples. And then we, if you see the type of testings, we have both unsupported and supported and for the supported, we have like, you know, different components, wire mesh, face plate, and all these like support system, they have, they have the fiber sensors, basically. And if you uh, see this uh, Texas Stream limestone specimens, they're pretty weak. And we chose this uh, specimen or this uh, Texas Stream limestone because we wanted to, you know, load this specimen, big specimen on, on the system, which can basically load them and didn't like exceed their, uh, uh, Capacity, so that's why like we choose the very low strength uh, Texas Stream limestone. This is just the geometrical uh, configuration for three different width wide ratio, like 0.5, 1, and 2. The cross section area was constant, 50 centimeter cross 50 centimeter, and the height goes from 100 to 25 centimeter. Okay, so for the experimental setup, so uh, as I mentioned, like we perform the uh, in Excel compressive test on the specimens or uh, different width wide ratio. So as the like you know they are very large scale samples. So what we we used the mine roof simulator facility at NIOS Pittsburgh facility because they can load up to like I guess uh, they have the capacity of 13 uh, mega newton. So that's why like we choose uh, choose this facility. And if you see the dimension of this plate, it's like around 20 feet cross 20 feet. So we can fit a lot like you know very big specimen inside. And the height can go to like, you know, the maximum height, I think it can go to around like 16 feet. And uh, what we did is like, we performed a displacement control uh, loading. So we moved uh, the load plate and very slowly, you know, so that we can maintain the quasi strict uh, conditions of the specimen. And then where we measure the vertical displacement of the specimen using the inbuilt LVDT that are present in the MRS. And then we also use the uh, DIC setup, as you can see, they have like two cameras on each setup so that we can capture the surface, you know, deformation of the specimen at each load step. And apart from that, we also had like, as I mentioned, we had fiber sensors on in the robot that were routed in the specimen. And also uh, in, the, in the specimen, some of the specimen where we didn't have robot. And they, the, the data for the fiber sensors were basically captured from the analyzer that we have. Uh, at, the, at the facility. So uh, as, you, as we know, the optical fiber sensors basically work on the principle of total internal reflections. So we have like light rays passing through this uh, core and then these, uh, the, the cladding has like, you know, lower uh, refractive index because of that we can have like total internal reflections. And uh, at a particular location, if we have any deformation or like, you know, Temperature change, the the amplitude and the frequency of this wave will change, 
and the analyzer will capture that and based on the you know transformation equation they will uh, they will give you the deformation at, at a particular location so the fiber sensor that we use it's a, a distributed optical fiber sensors it means like we can capture the you know the strain or the deformation at every 0.65 millimeter so it has very high resolution like we can capture the data at 0.65 millimeter at in, you know inside the specimen and to put this fiber sensor on the rock board, what we did is like we group, like you know, diametrically opposite two groups basically, so that we can use just single fiber sensor looping around, you know, that rock board. And they were like, you know, they were put on the surface of this rock board using the you know metal metal bonding adhesives and epoxy. And the data from these uh, fiber sensors were like you know captured at every seconds, so that like it can match with the load displacement curve or the load capture from the MRS machine and the DIC. So, so that the, like all the three uh, uh, monitoring technique can be like synchronized basically. So for the grouting, like we use pneumatic, uh, pneumatic uh, drilling uh, techniques. Uh, so we drill a hole in the center, we put our fiber sensors and rock bolt in the center of the specimen, and then we grout it with the non shrink precision grout that we purchased from Quakerite. And we allow them like to rest for at least 24 hours so that they can gain enough strength. And then for the width height of 0.5, which is very high, you know, high, we also use like double bolt. We can you can see like we have two bolts, one uh like they are basically like perpendicular to each other. However, like we have like sensors in both bolts, we were only able to capture the data from only one bolt because we had only like one analyzer at the at the facility. And for the uh, wire mess. We use the orbital wire mesh. The uh, I think the diameter of this wire mesh was very low. It's like point uh, one point six millimeter, which is very low. And then we use the face plate on this surface, so that like you know you can it can uh, it can okay uh, it can allow the wire mesh to be in contact with these surfaces of the vertical faces. You know? So that's why like we use face plate on both both sides. Uh, so for the results, we tested so like you know a lot of specimens, but I'm just like showing only few specimens here. As you can see, for the unsupported specimens, right, we tested three different width wide ratio, and you, if you can see, as we you know change the height, it means like if, when we are reducing the height, we can see the higher strength and more ductility, and this is due to you know basically the restraint or the boundary conditions of the interface between the platen and the specimen. This interface frictional angle that we have between the uh, specimen and the platen, they provide some constant or confining stresses on the specimen. And because of that, we can see the increment in the strength of the, of the specimen when we lower the height. But the, the one interesting result is when we put the rock bolt and wire mesh for the respective width wide ratio, the strength that didn't increase, it's like around 10 MPA, 10 MPA for width wide of 0.5. Also, like 14 MPA around uh, 13 MPA, same for the width height of one, and also same for the width height of two. So, why it's happening? Like we are not increasing the strength of the specimen, right? Even if we are, even if we are putting the rock bolt or also the wire mesh. However, if you see the post peak behavior, right, the residual strength and the ductility part they increases. So it means like even the specimen fails, they will not fail very quickly or suddenly. It means they can fail slowly, or it will like you know basically we can stop. There is a word called cascading pillar failure. So if you just stop like one pillar failure slowly or you know uh, basically uh, contain the spell or small material or anything, then it will allow like you know it will basically not travel to the other pillars. The other pillars will not fail. So that's like the only mechanism we are only able to capture that is the post peak behavior with the implementation of the support system. However, like if you see, uh, there's one more thing, like, you know, for the width of two, we see like more load mobilization or like, you know, more effect in the, in the specimen than the other specimen. And maybe this is because like, you know, if I'll show you the failure pattern and everything for the specimen, the failure pattern, they didn't change for the width of one and two, but it changed for width of two, where it, it was able to like contain a lot of materials with the implementation of support. And that's why like we were able to provide some confinement to these specimens, but not for the width height of one and uh, 0.5.
And we also like uh, evaluated or computed our, you know, the different components of the strain from the uh, fiber sensors that we have in the log board. So I told you like we have a loop, right? So we were able to capture total strain in both loops and then we decompose them in bending strain and the exit strain for both, you know, for the, for the log board. So, and we can calculate this data for every load step so that we can understand the mechanism, you know, like at which load step or at which time we are seeing like rise in the, you know, sector or anything. And if we have the deformation in the elastic range, we can also evaluate the Excel load in the rock board using the hook slope. And you can uh, see this formula for evaluating of these uh, components of the sprint data. So I'll show you this figure. I don't know if I'll be able to show you. You can see the evolution of the, you know, the Excel force in the rock bolt and also the specimen failure that we capture from the DIC, right? You can see this part is failing. And once it fails, you can see this part going down and only this part going up because this, this big fracture is coming up and providing some load, more load on the rock bolt. But this, this area is you now it's gone, it's spall from the surface. And that's why like on this, on this part of the rock board, we are not able to see these deformations. So from this type of like understanding, we can make our, uh, we can understand the basically the micro mechanic behind the, you know, uh, the working principle of this rock board, after rock board under monotonic loading condition of these uh, pillars. Also like in the post, post peak region, right? If you see, we can also see some surfacial features that we see on the specimen that we capture from the DIC, we can see similar behavior on the rock board that is basically inside the specimen. So you can see the peak that we have here, similar thing like, right, that I saw in the video, that this part is falling off. And that's why when it's failing, you know, this providing more, uh, I think, strain on the rock board. And because of that, you can see peak on the fiber sensors. <laughs> and because of this, like, understanding, we can, what we can do is like, Later on, like we can calibrate our numerical model based on all these like you know data, and then build a predictive or very good predictive numerical models, which can be used to understand the very complex behavior of mechanism. And the wire mess, we use the wire mess also as I mentioned. But if you see right, it was able to capture or like contain all the failure materials inside the specimen, so we will not see any material falling off the specimen. And it also like in, increases our the uh, ductility part of the curve. However, the strength they didn't increase when we put the wire mesh. So, but the thing is like you know the failure of the wire mesh, right? If you see, the, they mostly like fails from the corner where we have like higher stress <clears throat> concentration. And this is like very like uh, low diameter and low strength wire mesh. And that's why we see so much failure, you know, of the wire mesh. But however, like it gives us some understanding, like how basically the wire mesh were able to like contain the spall material, and then they can pro provide some confinement to the specimen, you know. So in conclusion, we, we saw that peak and lateral strength increases as big twice ratio increases. It's uh, it's the phenomenon that we observe for every specimens. And the rock bolt and wire mesh, uh, wire mesh that doesn't affect the peak strength. However, the residual strength increases with the addition of supports. The rock bolt load normalization was observed to be higher for the width to height two case compared to the width to height of 0 0.5 and 1. Localized rock bolt deformation was able, like we were able to capture the localized rock bolt deformation through the use of fiber sensors. And currently, like we're trying to capture all these phenomena using our numerical modeling tool. We are using distinct element modeling. Uh, UDEC and both like 3 deck in 3D. And we are trying to like calibrate our numerical model that or with the data that we get in the laboratory test. And once we calibrate it, then we can have uh, different types of bolting pattern, different uh, loading conditions. And maybe based on that, like we can have some some idea of like, you know, support design for the pillars. And one more thing, you know, this rock has like 26% porosity. So we are also trying to model that porosity in our uh, in, in the numerical model. If we ever, that we, if we'll like, you know, with the inclusion of these pores, like basically how the deformation mechanism and the failure mechanism of this pillar will change, basically. <clears throat> yeah, thank you. Uh, so I saw that you used wire mesh. Uh, did you consider a case where you used wire mesh in addition to shock cream? No. No, because this is not very, very big specimens. They're like, we're trying to like do some kind of like large scale. 
but it's not a field case scenario. It's very difficult to do the sort create environments on these specimens. You know? So we're just trying to understand this behavior first, like wire mesh and the rock board, the structural elements basically. And maybe like once we'll have idea of these elements, I can in the modeling, I can use the top you know, elements. Okay. Maybe try to see like what, what is its effect on the PS. But not in the lab. So is there anything that you observed during your uh, experimental program that surprised you? Because it seems like a lot of the conclusions that you drew could have been hypotheses at the start that would have been guessed anyway. So did anything surprise you? I uh, was surprised. <laughs> yeah, this hypothesis that the conclusion that I presented here, yeah, most of the people have done work, but they were on the very small scale or ideal conditions, you know. Either they did like pull out test or sear test on the rock board to understand its mechanism, or either they use a very small scale, uh, you know, test where they wrapped around, you know, steel wires or everything, and then they try to make some conclusion. But with this work, we can like almost say, like, okay, this works. Basically, provide some validates, validation with the you know small scale uh, testing that we have or the ideal ideal loading conditions that we have. And maybe the results can be used for numerical modeling. But yeah, no. So it might have been interesting to, to put this out as a hypothesis at the start, and then come back and say, yep, yeah, yeah. There's there's three issues. Can you go back to your bit right there that picture that you just showed? Showing the block. This one? So the bolt, so you're using full length grounded bolts. Yep. Okay, so our cartridge or are you pumped? We are not pumping, we are using uh, the grout. Uh, so what two we are doing. Two part grout you put in and you break it and mix it while you're putting it. No, we are just using a uh, cement grout. Okay. So okay. We, we are allowing the gravity to pour down and that's all. Okay, so <laughs> if you go back to that one page, there you go. So you're putting plates on both sides of the block. Yeah. So in those cases, now you have two nodes that you're actually putting the compression into the block or into the pillar, yeah. right? Rather than a conventional bolt where you have the plate and then you have the grout, which is a continuous length bolt, right? Yeah. You know, for, and so that the dynamics of this are are very different between what you would do in a conventional limestone operation versus in, in terms of operations. Where you pop, put the grout in, you put the bolt in, or put the bolt in and put the grout in through the bolt, right? Yeah. Versus being able to pour the grout in, put the bolt in, and then you secure it on either side with the plate. The dynamics of both of those things are very, very different. Yeah, definitely. Like we, with this uh, face plate, we're not like doing any pre tensioning, you know? So definitely the pre tensioning part from that, what we see in the industry or <laughs> is missing. The only purpose of this face plate is. You know, uh, supporting that wire mesh with the with the structure that we have. That's all. Okay. Yeah, we're not trying to understand the effect of basically the face plate. I, I like your work. The the other thing at the very front, you showed the statistics for ground fault, fatalities, and injuries. Yeah. You gotta be careful when you use those data, right? The vast majority of fatalities in metal non metal operations in the last five years, they haven't been because of mass failure of the roof or to the back, right? <clears throat> it's been, you know, wedge failures as a consequence of the fracture envelope around the workings and the rock comes down, right? Yeah. That's been done, you know, both in Tennessee and Nevada, both the fatalities that occurred last year were solely about small, small rocks falling, not major failure. Yeah, so, yeah. So that's why, like I mentioned this term, like fall of phase, deep, what we learned. And they're like also like I think CDC and IELTS, they also mentioned some few words, you know, describing these fatalities, but I just omitted these parts. Well, yeah. But but you know, and still you gotta be careful on, okay. on how you write this one. You put the bolt in, did you apply any load bolts? I mean, did it tension or not? No, we didn't do any pretensioning on the bolt. So first we put the bolt and then we grout it. So this was like we didn't do any pretensioning. So that we, we don't want it to disturb the ground. In your simulation, can you apply some sort of a load? Yeah, in the simulations, we can do pre-tensioning. And uh, that's, that's my another goal. Like, you know, if you if I want to simulate basically just the faceplate, I want to do like some pre-tensioning in the faceplate. And then, you know, 
uh, do the exit load on the on the specimens. Good job. Thank you. So our second speaker is Mansell. He has worked on uh, organizing the seminar. But uh, he's going to talk about respirable dust characterization and what is that? Cutting the battery. <laughs> Cutting the battery. <laughs> Please welcome, Mansell. I don't think I need a. Okay, hello. I'll be talking about respirable dust characterization and coding geometry. So, probably the question might arise why dust? We talk about dust because it happens to be one of the most of the critical part in the mining industry, even constructions. It gives a lot of um, uh, diseases like silicosis and the uh, pneumococcus that affect a lot of mine workers. And uh, <laughs> the graph here you see, this is uh, from, you can see from 1970 to 2020, how fatalities and uh, a lot of destruction from uh, dust in the mining industry have been affecting a lot of people. Of course, we've got um, uh, NIOSH, MSHA, CDC, and uh, they are bringing a lot of um, uh, processes and how best we can reduce the dust so that uh, fatality and sicknesses will be removed from uh, mining workers, especially those working in the underground. So for my research, actually, I was never prepared for, I was not planning to present this time, except, you know, I've done part of uh, like 50% of the research parts, and then the 50% will be as we go on. Um, I'll be looking at three different rocks. I'll be looking at coal, I'll be looking at porridge, and then mudstone, and uh, we'll be using the LCM at full scale in order to do the test. And then uh, I'll be looking at a uh, different peak again. I'm looking at the conical peaks and I'm uh, looking at the radial peaks. Of course, played on in the LCM, we take different uh, materials from the, I will take the dust, I will take some fine materials and then of course rock particles. But for my research, I'll only pay attention to the dust which is uh, my own part, and then the fines and other smaller rock chips will be stored for further research <laughs> process. And then if you look at this one, I will look at uh, three different labs where we we'll process our the, the samples, because uh, the saddles, of, I will show you the picture just after this, that I've placed um, uh, the cassette in four different places, two at the front and then two at the back. So for this one, I will take the three different cassettes because they are filtered into three different labs for analysis. Basically, I'll be looking at uh, for characteristics. I'm not looking at chemical. I'm looking at physical characteristics. In that in that case, I'm looking at uh, the aspect ratio. I'm looking at the roughness and I'm looking at the roundness into different shape. And then I also be looking at the concentration because uh, I want to see what happens when the beat wears out from new to moderate to worn out how much exactly amount of dust we are generating from this different piece. At the end of the day, whatever results and that we are get from there will be used by different industry to see, okay, if you are working with a one out bit, you say, okay, we can generate this amount of dust. At the end of the day, you'll be able to say, okay, I should increase the dust suppression or ventilation system just to help out and then in reducing the dust within the mines. Right, first I'll look at uh, the SCM. Analysis that the test um, at the geological department. In general, that's just to give an image of uh, the dust. We take this one and then there is also the PE software, which also analyze the, the minerals within those dust and then their percentages as well. Part of uh, another filter will be going for NIO 700. Now 7500 is generally looking at the, the silica crystalline concentration. I'm not looking at, as I said earlier on, I'm not looking at uh, the chemical, you know. Exactly. And then another part of the, again, another filter again would go for the laser diffraction. That is also another concentration. Um, uh, laboratory where I can see how much amount and then in terms of concentration and then within those cassettes. So from there, 
I'll go to the Nikon and the microscopic um, uh, lab at uh, Marcus Hall. That is also used to determine the physical characteristics of the dust particle. Because if you know the physical characteristics of this dust particle, you can able to bring up to say, okay, because of this and this is how dangerous they might be. This is how they behave, you know. Because in general, I'm just looking at the respirable part of the dust. Okay. And then, of course, the dust particles are now of all these ones, they're just the smaller fractions, you know, that remains in the air while cutting is going on. In order why we are doing this as well, is just for the recommendation from NIOSH and CDC to say in underground or whatever concentration, we keep the concentration of this and uh, the respirable dust to three milligrams per meter cube, you know. Okay. Now this is my test, um, uh, my test metrics are general. Of course, as I said earlier on, I'll be looking at cold, porridge, and mud stone, looking at two different bits, the conical, radial, and uh, <laughs> the conical and radial, the bit condition, because I'm looking at uh, three stages of the bits. I'm looking at new, moderate, and warm for the cold. All of them, and you can see there. And then the cutting geometry actually determines the advanced rates because the cutting geometry determines how those machines, when they are cutting the face, and then how they go, right? So I'm looking at the penetration at one end, and I'll also be looking at the spacing. So for the coal, I have this um, uh, penetration differently with this one. For the product, as you can see, I said it is a variable um, uh, cutting geometry because. Uh, for the coal, it is just at um, uh, zero degrees, right? The bit will be placed at zero degrees, but for the porridge, I'll place it at we place it at different different angles, 10, 20, 25, up to 40 degrees. This is just to determine to see what happens when you tilt the, the beads, what happens with the dust, whether you're creating a lot of fines, you know, just the physical characteristics of this dust. Okay. Definitely, if we go to the mines, we know there are different places you can generate dust. Of course, we know how those fractions um, uh, dust are created, uh, generated, when those fractions of the coal or whatever rock samples, you know, when you break it, you see some fragments, you know, coming off. From those ones, you can say, okay, these ones are the finer particles. And then, you know, most of these ones, if during crushing again of hard rocks, you can also generate dust from there. We all know again if you're doing blasting, drilling, and even um, uh, transportation, a lot of dust can be created from there. Now, there is just one picture I took for the, you know, there is a, the bit interaction. This is just a call. You see the bit interaction for a continuous miner, how the bits interact with different, you know, angles. This one tells us the penetrations. And then from this interaction, this is how exactly the bits we are, we are out as we go from one rock sample to another. So you can see, I'll be looking at uh, this where condition, there is the new, and then in between you can get the moderate, and then of course we can get the totally worn out. We, from other studies, um, uh, other hypotheses, you can say, uh, they, they've said, okay, the more the bits we are out, the more you generate dust. But generally, I want to see um, uh, what fraction and then what happens with them, right? Okay, so that is basically the LCM test. You can see on the left here, this is the LCM test we're gonna do. And then uh, we've done, we've done some, we'll be doing some again. The pumps are placed at the one end of the LCM. Of course, this is the beach right there. If you can see, one part of this again, we place cotton around the bits whilst we will be doing the test. <laughs> the purpose of that cotton is two. We have two purposes of that one. One is to prevent um, uh, external material getting into my cassettes, right? And then again, we also place that cotton so that we don't want some amount of dust to go out. Because you remember I said I'm looking at the concentrations it's because I want to bring out figures. Now with this... Uh, Apparatus for the dust analysis. I have the pump there, which is always uh, calibrated as 1.7 liters per minute, per minute, just to see um, uh, it's responsible there for when the 
Uh, during cutting, right, we have a vacuum that um, uh, pumps out air. When it pumps out air, that's you know, responsible for, you know, these respirable doors that are below 10 micron to just be flying out and then I'll be able to capture it. So when we look at them, I have different cassettes. I have my little the TDS that will be taken to the SCM and then these two, these other four will be taken at different lab. The brown one there, that is one goes to the NIOSH 7500 analysis and these other two can be taken for the laser diffraction for particle size distribution analysis. Okay, that is just go. Okay, now for this one, we've not started collecting the dust yet because that is the point of conditioning the rock. We condition the rock so that uh, we get a, a parallel surface. All the surface will be equal to the bits because I'm still looking at uh, to say, okay, I can get concentration from here, concentration from here. Part of this um, uh, test again, sometimes it becomes a limitation is that uh, the rock sample, mostly they are then condom with uh, concrete. But what we did for the last time, because I don't want a lot of contamination of concrete samples, <laughs> At the right, at the end, at the start of the rock samples here, we normally chip off the concrete samples, right, before collecting the dust, because I don't want the concrete samples, the concrete dust, to get into my filters for analysis, because it will also alter the results we get. Right, so now, as I said, I'll be using three different labs for the analysis. One, the image analysis will be done at the SCM laboratory to see how the images are. And then another sample will go for the NASH 7500 for silica crystalline analysis. And the other fine particle will be going for the laser diffraction analysis to see the particle size distribution. Now you can see different ones here. This one is the, the test scan of the SCM. Instruments we have at uh, the geological department, definitely, firstly. So we place mostly the, <clears throat> the, the cassettes, the, the filter from those cassettes, which took from the TDS. Normally it comes here, and then you place it, of course, we can increase the resolution. Mostly it has 15 kV to see how those images are. When we're done from the first computer, you can see, and then you get a screenshot of it. You send it to the PE. Um, uh, software that is also used to analyze and then see whatever type of minerals are found in these um, uh, images. And then from there, the results we, I get from here, from this, this image we get here, I will also take that image and then go with it for the Nikon analysis, the Nikon laboratory. That is also, that's we, how we do that one, when you get those image, it's created like a mesh around the image. So you were able to see, okay, how the edges are, how rough they are, and then the roundness, and then, you know, for all those physical characteristics I've been looking at. Now, this is just, a, I just, this is just one image from the TDS. Initially, when you place it, you can see it is placed here. When we place it there for 20, uh, 20 micrometer, you can see this one for just 11. That is uh, how the image will look like, right? Before increasing the, 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 before we increase the resolution. Once you increase the resolution, you get an image like this. So what we do, we take different, different, different spots from here. You analyze them just to see the amount of mineral, the type of minerals that are also found here and then at different, different percentages. So the result from the PE, applications, right, the software, this is how it looks like. You place the image right there, and then when you increase the resolution, you take different, different spots. For every spot you take, it will give you like this. So if I have a lot of image, I will take like more than 100 different spots just to get a, a comparative analysis and see whatever you maybe come up as a conclusion 
for that. So far, so good. This is where I've stopped for my project so far. On type of question. Okay, I think. Um, Akash, okay. Okay, I apologize. Wow. Uh, so, um, my question was you said you were doing cutting at different um, angles. Yes. Uh, why were you only doing it for a coal at zero? No, well, for, uh, for coal, that is, I'm not the only one working on that. For, uh, okay. Yeah. Um, uh, there are other students looking at different, different um, data, right, for coal. So, and then normally again, for the coal and the mines, because whatever I'm doing here, it should be applicable for what happens at the mine, right, at the mines. So for coal again, mostly for those that um, uh, the road headquarters and um, uh, the continuous miner, they are almost always, always play that that's a good point mining. Okay, thank you. Can I answer that question? Sorry. Uh, the angle of the type of both of them are 45 degrees. Mm -hmm. For products example, they are different field angles. And the reason for that is a completely different project. And the reason behind that is must be the company wanted to uh, optimize their cutter head. That's why they wanted to try different uh, field angles. To make, and they had a, a, a harsh wear out on the side of the machine that they just wanted to realize what was the purpose, what, what, what was the reason. So yeah, the reason behind it, the punishment you think of angles data is that. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I can go. So yeah. So you are using like just one cut, right? For your experiment. Just one cut, right? One cutter? For your experiments. No, we're using them uh, for the porridge is different and then uh, from the for the cold and the more stone are also different. So how many cutters you are using? For the forage, I'm using two different pieces, the radial and the conical. Right, but each time you are using one, right? Wrong, linear yeah, not a linear action. No, yes, yes, of course, yes. For each one, for each, in fact, for each yeah. one sample, we're using one cutter. Okay. So how are you going to coordinate your data for just one cutter with so many cutters that you have in the field? Well, um, for this one, I have limited my research for the conical because it is the most um, uh, bit used in the mining, for, mostly for coal. Yeah. So the question is something else. <clears throat> what he's talking about is that then the cutter head is operating, there are multiple cutter cuttings. So yes. How do you differentiate between Just real speak. world with this particular test when you cut it only one cutter? Oh, that's why you see the you know, my cutting geometry, right? That I I showed, or we have. Okay, you see the from the cutting geometry here. Even though I'm using one cutter at a time, right? For each one sample, which is the conical bits for the coal and the more stone, but we also vary. For each core sample, we also vary the penetration, right? We vary the penetration and then we have different, different spaces. So for whatever we say, okay, because this one, the, uh, the conical bits, which I'm using, of course, I know there are different, different ones, but we're using the conical because we say, okay, it is the most commonly used for the continuous minor and the and the header. Anyway, the answer, <clears throat> But what he is doing is relative. They're trying to find out between one geometry and the other geometry, and even by your one other, what happens with one at the generation because on the other hand, you've had secondary, tertiary project happening. And that's the point. Yes, sir. Uh, if you are simulating the real mine environment. How do you need to account for things like ventilation? In the real mind, it's actually ventilation. Yeah, well, uh, even though my research might not go on to control measures, I'm not looking at control measures of this one because I'm just looking at uh, how much you get, right? If you, the miners know that uh, when using the new piece, um, uh, we're generating drugs to this percent, 
or when we go to the moderates, we're generating dust to this percent. That will also be used for, you know, to say, okay, this is the control measures. My research does not go to control measures to see whether we are using them at dust suppression and then ventilation. Sure. So it's your research question to assess how much dust is generated? Yeah. 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 Yes, uh, the research actually is, is uh, just to assist how much dust is generated by this different peak that will help um, uh, these manufacturers and uh, the industry in them, uh, in ways to see, okay, if they can also try to see, okay, if the one out is generating a lot of dust and it gives, uh, it increases the cost of uh, ventilation, whatever. So it means they can also say, okay, if we, the cost of ventilation because of the one out, Creating a lot of loss, we can say, okay, the loss don't use the one out. We can just stop at the moderate and then go. So what you're looking for is a correlation between the more worn out bids and make it more cost effective to say, hey, we're spending this much on ventilation to deal with the increased air, uh, dust to justify a newer bid. Yeah. Just ask, you know, in general question, because it's germane to that, what Ryan just said. How do how that replaced in a regular continuous miner? You know, if you're mining potash, for example, how do how do you when does when do the operators switch out bits? How do they know when to do that? The operators for the replacement of the bits. So all the bits were at different rates, right? Yes. And their location and the operator of the other miner, right? So how do you make the determination when to replace this? Because you don't replace one at a time, right? Yes. You replace them all, or majority. Yeah, first, uh, replacement of those bits. The bits we are first depends on the positions that are placed on the, on the, on the, on the, on the, drum. On the drum, right? Bits placed in different angles wear differently. Right, so a lot of studies have gone on to say, okay, a couple of um, uh, papers that I read, you know, those they do realize that uh, most of the bits placed at the side, which are either 45 degrees or 40 degrees and below, sometimes they take much, their lifespan is far greater than the ones placed at the center. So it depends on the position in which the bit is placed, and uh, that determines the replacement time. Yeah, but still, as an operator, you need to make a decision when to do that because you're shutting the machine down, right? Yes. Takes so. time. But from the operator point of view, the question is how often do you inspect and change the cutter? There you go. That's it. Okay, have not gone. No, so. Once a month. No, well, my research does not cover that part yet. And uh, to the time but of that's an important question, yeah. right? Okay, yeah. Because you sure. never replace it before that. Yes. We, the, you want to help? The lab, we have to send them the bill. <laughs> we got the machine, right? Yep. Usually they replace one bit at a time. When they just look at a face, you can see the bruise. If you're missing a bruise, that line is missing. Yeah, but you know exactly where we're, where I'm talking about. The same line you are. Yeah. Yeah. What they'll do is they'll set it down and what they'll do is 50% of the bits in the high wear areas. But they do, you know, the inspection and replacement is a function of the safety. You know, the inspection, you know, the operating room, right? Okay. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So thank you again. I mean, this is the last seminar for this year. So we'll see you guys uh, next semester. Thank you. Great job. Great job.